Warning! Tube amplifiers have lethal voltages inside them. Please do not attempt to build, test, or repair these without understanding and following all safety protocols. Hey y'all! This is the first of the series on our little Spud 2.0 amp, which is going to be a mostly educational series about building a tube amp from a schematic. And there's a lot of schematics online for like known good sounding amplifiers, but they may not be complete. They may not show you like what power transform you need to do. Some of them don't even have a power supply. They just say put 300 volts here or put 250 volts here. And you know, some of them don't even have the voltages on them. You know, hopefully, you know, it does make it easier if they've got at least some of the you know, kind of expected voltages, especially like cathode and plate voltages. But luckily the one we have does have that. And I trust that Kegger, a guy who passed away that used to be on Audio Karma, he designed a bunch of really good sounding amplifiers that are very simple and kind of fit my design philosophy. I wish I could have met the guy. But anyway, um, he... Turn me on to the whole shade feedback thing, reading through his posts and all that. So we're going to build one of his amps, and it's going to be using the 6LU8 Compactron 2, which is these weird, like, 12-pin fat bottle kind of guys. Some of them are a little short, squatty ones. These are a little taller. These have a 16-watt power pentode combined with a triode so that we can build a complete you know driver output tube amplifier using two tubes hence the name spud amp and so i don't know who coined that term but that's what people call them and i think this is going to be a really neat project it should easily have twice maybe three times the power that the little 6bm8 amp had and while it's not going to be as robust is like an EL34 amp, it's actually going to have more power than a EL84 amp would. And so I think this is going to be a fun project. So we're going to go through this showing you at the start how I just kind of get started and how I pick things like, you know, what kind of power transformer we need for this, what kind of output transformers are going to work well for this. You know, how do we how do we make sure that the coupling cap is the right size and it's going to work with the frequency that we're expecting from our output transformers? Because we don't want to create more low frequency than the transformers can deal with because that can hurt performance. Also going to go through things like, you know, cathode bypass caps, how you calculate those. And a lot of this stuff, there's... I'm not going to say it's really complicated math, but, you know, it's it's math that you have to really sit down and think about and double check. And I'm using website online calculators. And some people might think that's cheating and whatever. I, I never claim to be an electrical engineer. While I do have kind of a math brain, I still take the lazy way out. And, like, if I can find an online calculator where I just plug in some numbers and poof, out comes the information I need... I'm going to use that. Also going to go through the PSUD simulation software. Now, I'm not a big fan of LT Spice. I played with it a little bit, and the learning curve is pretty steep. And from my experience, that while it is a good tool to get you to a certain point, I think you can do a similar thing just building stuff. And I found the results aren't great especially if you have transformers that aren't accurately modeled and tube models that are accurately modeled and i think some of the especially the output transformer models really aren't even close to what reality is and so anyway i'm not going to get into you know lt spice but we are going to go through psud2 simulation software for the power supply and it really gets you close to being able to pick like the right voltage center tapped transformer to get the B plus DC that you need. And you can also see how much ripple is in the DC, which 
on a push-pull amp isn't as important because the push-pull action, they cancel that kind of noise out, or for the most part do. On an SE amp, you absolutely need a clean power supply. And honestly, the cleaner the better. Most of the noise that you end up in uh, SE amp is not from heaters if they're wired right. You don't need DC heaters to make them quiet, but you do need a very filtered power supply. So let's get into figuring this out. Okay, so let's start looking at the schematic. And this is what we're going to be working from. This is a design done by the late Kegger, who is a very prolific poster on Audio Karma, a really nice website that I frequent quite a lot. And I like his schematics and his designs. For one thing, they're very simple and there's not a lot of stuff in the signal path. He was the one that turned me on to this shade feedback way of getting some clarity with a single-ended ultralinear power amplifier. And so I think this is going to be a really good sounding little spud amp. And while he has two different tubes listed here, he's got a 12AT7 and EL34, we're actually going to be using the 6LU8 tube. And this is the pentode section, and here's the triode section. So what do we have to go on here that we need to like figure out? And one of them is we want to be using a 5K SE ultralinear transformer. And I've got a pair of 15 watt ones ready to go for this project. The other thing is we've got 290 to 330 volts, he's saying, on the B+. So let's keep that in mind. We are not going to use these bypass caps. I know Kager likes putting them in his amps. I didn't like the way they sounded. So we're just going to be using a straight 33 UF, 220 UF. We're going to check the value of this capacitor to make sure it's what we want to see. Even this 270K, we're probably going to be checking that out. We might be able to raise that up and then make this a smaller coupling capacitor as part of our fine tuning of this thing. The main things we need to be concerned with right now are we've got the B plus here. And then the thing I really like about Kegger's designs is he always shows the voltages. So we got basically 35 volts on the cathode across a 600 to 750 ohm resistor here. And then we got two volts across a 620 ohm. And I'm probably going to also put a red LED plus resistor to get this two volts on the cathode, but that'll be in the future drawing of the schematic. Let's figure out what we need to do to make this kegger design work and how to get a power supply built and all that kind of stuff. So the next thing we need to do is look up the data sheet for this 6LU8. So let's go in here and look over the maximum ratings on this stuff that this tube can handle. So the first thing we're going to look at is the heaters. And looks like we've got 1.5 amps for each tube at 6.3 volts. So we need to make sure the power transformer that we use is capable of putting out 6.3 volts. So the next thing we're going to look at is the cathode to DC voltage and it'll take 100 volts we're at 35 so we're well within that we're not going to worry ourselves with all of these capacitances we're going to come down here and look at the plate voltage the max is 400 volts the grid voltage max is 300 volts so we probably want to run this tube at fairly high voltage I'm thinking he is right where he was saying 290 to 330 volts. We're probably going to want to shoot for 310 to 320 volts. And we should be right at this maximum of 300 volts on the ultralinear or the screen tap. And with the ultralinear, you can be a little over. I'm not too worried. 
if it's you know we end up with 310 on the screen and we can bring that down a little bit with a resistor if we need to so here's the other key thing is 14 watts of plate dissipation and then we have 2.75 watts of screen dissipation so we add those two together we get 16.75 watts so just to be safe we'll call it 16 watts we're not going to be anywhere near this peak cathode current so we don't really need to worry about that now here's an interesting thing to look at too grid circuit resistance and this is the self bias that's what we're going to be doing and the maximum that the resistor can be on the triode or the front end could be 2.2 megs and it's actually saying we can have 2.2 megs on the trentode as well so we go back to our diagram he's got a 270k this could actually be a 2 meg resistor and so we're probably going to want to raise this up to a 470 or a 510K to be able to lower the value of this coupling cap because my feeling is that amps sound better with smaller coupling caps as long as we're not creating a high pass filter that's killing the low end frequency response of the amplifier. So now that we know what the ratings are here, let's go over here and look at this tube bias calculator. Now, one of the things, again, that I may change in this is he's saying up to 330 volts. I think we want to target closer to that because we got 35 volts here on the cathode and we can have 300 volts across this tube without it being a problem. So... I think we should shoot for more around 330, maybe even 340 volts on the power supply and then have 300 volts across the tube. So we're going to go back to our bias calculator here and let's say we're going to have 300 volts across the tube. Because in my experience, single and amps sound better at higher voltages. And we need to change this to... 16 watts and so we could run up to a maximum of 50 milliamps on the cathode and be okay with cathode bias so let's look at this number we've got 50 milliamps is it max dissipation or at 95 percent and we want to run these tubes pretty hot here we can use the dissipation of the cathode resistor voltage drop method so we got one resistor and let's look back here let's go ahead and put the 35.5 and then he was suggesting a 600 to 750 ohm let's put the 600 ohm in and see where we're at so the total cathode current is 59 milliamps and then they're assuming that 5.5 percent of it is going to be the screen current and so they're saying 55 milliamps, and we need to get it around 50. So let's go to this 750 ohm resistor. Let's see what that gets us. And see, that's a little cool. We're only at 83% of the tube. So let's try a 650 ohm. Probably somewhere around a 650 ohm would be a good starting point. Now again, when we put this thing in the amp, we may have to do some experimenting with this cathode resistor because we're estimating what the voltage is going to be. But this is a good starting point. So we go back to the schematic. He's saying somewhere between 600 and 750 ohm. 650 ohm will be a hotter bias and a 750 ohm would be a cooler bias. So we're going to start with a 650 ohm cathode resistor, hoping we see 35 volts on it. And we'll come back and adjust all this accordingly when we first pull it up on the Variac. So I'm going to come over here and make sure what kind of wattage we have on this resistor. So we have 35 volts across a 650 ohm resistor. And you can set this in 
ohms or kilo ohms or mega ohms and you can look for amps or milliamps that kind of stuff we'll go ahead and put milliamps in here and then we're going to calculate and basically it's going to have two watts going across it you want to have at least double the wattage that you're actually pulling across the resistor in its rating and so I believe a 5 watt resistor will be plenty so again we put in 700 there's our 50 milliamps and if we come over here we put in 700 ohms calculate there they're at 90 percent plate dissipation 700 ohm might be what we're shooting for the tubes will run a little cooler and it's still going to be running hot enough to sound good so when we go shopping, I may get a 650 and a 700 ohm and play with those when we get them put in the amp. Okay, so we've decided that we're going to be running this thing at 330 volts on the plate, or over here on the output transformer, and maybe even on the plate. So if it came out at 335, that wouldn't be the end of the world. So we've kind of figured out the biasing on this tube. We've looked at the specs on how hot we can run this tube and how much power without burning it up. We know what size output transformer to use. So the next thing we need to look at is the size of this bypass cap in relationship to this resistor. So this is another website I found about bypass caps and calculating them up. And so we're going to start off with 20 hertz is the frequency to be filtered out. We want the resistor in parallel to the ca capacitor, and the resistor is going to be 700 ohms. And it says we need a capacitor of at least 114 UF to bypass for frequencies at 20 hertz or greater. So let's go ahead and drop this down to 15 hertz just to be safe and we're down at 152 UF at 15 Hertz even with the 650 ohm it will bypass to ground all the frequencies from 12 Hertz and up so a 220 UF like he has in the schematic is plenty large for this bypass capacitor so we know we've got that covered the next thing you want to look at is the coupling cap. So here is the impedance, which is going to be this resistor. And I'll show you how this relationship works. Let's go ahead and put this 270K in. So here's our optimal low frequency response would be 26 hertz. So if we put the 33 UF in, and it's down to 17. And that's why he was saying to put a... 33 UF cap in there. If we put a 470K in there, that allows us to use a 22 UF. Even a 620K would allow us to use a 0.15 coupling cap. And again, I really feel like that the smaller coupling caps give a crisper sound than those larger ones. They even talk about that down here. The higher the capacitor value, the more material in the signal path, the more material in the signal path, well, you know where this is going, the less transparent the signal becomes. So again, it's showing it can be 2.2 megs, so I think we're perfectly safe going to a 620K or something around in that range that's an available resistor and going with 0.15 UF coupling caps, which should make the amp sound better. We know we want 2 volts here. We can put a 1.6 volt drop LED in place of this resistor and then put a small resistor in series with it to get us to this 2 volts. So really the only thing left is to come up with how are we going to design the power supply and I'll show you how we do that. So now we're going to look at this PSU D2 simulation software and I use this for a lot of my power supply designing and so I've looked up 
a lot of these things leading up to this just to kind of show you how we get here. So I found this transformer. It's a Hammond 550 volt, which is 275 volt, zero 275 volt. So that's how you list this. Now we're using a solid state rectifier and you can see when we simulate that, now we're up to 327 volts. Now this resistor here can be tuned to try to get the voltage where we want. We have this three and a half Henry, 100 ohm DC resistance choke here. We've got a 33 UF cap for this first one. We've got a 100 UF cap for the second one. And the third cap is going to be a 220 UF, which is basically our storage cap too, to really give this load a place to pull some current from so we don't have any sag in the power supply. So if we want to raise this B plus up a little bit, all we need to do is change this resistor value to, let's change it to 100 ohms, and re-simulate this, and we get 340 volts. So as you see, we can use the value of this resistor here to tune this power supply to the voltage we want. And I think we'll go with this. So this is going to be how we do our power supply. And you can see you can come in here and, you know, change these things. You can have like an RC filter, which is a resistor capacitor. You can have just a capacitor filter. You can have an LC, which is a choke filter, which is what this is here. This is this right here is a choke filter. This is a capacitor filter. And then here's an RC, which is a resistor capacitor filter. And we're going with a capacitor input power supply using a full wave rectifier, which uses two diodes and a center tapped transformer. So Hammond has a power transformer that's a nice size for this build that's 550 volts. But our limitation is it's got 104 milliamps rating on that. It's got 3 amps on the 6.3 volts, which covers our two one and a half amp heaters so we're good there it's also got a five volt two amp tap which we're not going to be using so that will help keep the temperature of the power transformer down a little bit by not using that two amps of current that's available so we're going to have about six milliamps of current on the input triodes and then we were saying we're going to have about 50 milliamps each. And so we've got 104 milliamps of the transformer to work with. As long as we keep the cathode current on those output pentodes at 50 milliamps or below, we should be fine using this 270DX transformer. And you just play around with these different numbers and keep hitting simulate. And it will give you a warning if you do something crazy that's going to overload the system. Well, I hope you were able to follow along with that and that this wasn't too complicated. I think now we have a good basis for how to build this thing and how to get the power supply that we need. I think solid state power supply is definitely the way to go to that. It gives us some extra room, especially the way we're going to be using this little switch. It's going to sit there, and as you can see, it's fairly deep, and it's going to take up the space where a tube rectifier could go. Plus, it just complicates the wiring, and I think this power transformer, while it's adequate, it's not overpowered. And we need to be careful about not creating too much heat in it by adding that two amps of current from the tube rectifier. So I think we got a good plan. So from here, I'm going to start working on the chassis fabrication, which I think is something that really hinders some people from moving forward with this. And while you know, until you get some practice, it's not easy. And especially if you don't have the right tools, it's not easy. And some of the tools aren't super cheap, but it is what it is. I mean, you can, you know, use like one of those step drills to drill some of these holes. And that probably will work better if you get an aluminum chassis instead of the steel one that I'm doing. 
The other benefit to an aluminum chassis is they come unfinished, and so you can do all your fab work to it and then paint it with some like textured Krylon paint. It'll look very similar to this black powder coating. It might not be quite as durable, but at that point, you've already got all the you know metal work done and you're less likely to scratch the finish than you would probably be you know starting out with this powder coated chassis and doing the metal work on a finished surface you got to be real careful when you're working with these that you don't scratch them up while you're working on them and so probably if this is your first build i'd recommend getting this box in the same size maybe even a little bigger to give you a little more room you know this is kind of on the small side and as it gets smaller and more compact you start kind of running out of real estate and it's tighter getting in there working so you know I'll put a couple of optional you know different chassis in the bomb again I haven't built this yet I don't know what this thing's going to sound like how it's going to work I'm assuming that everything's going to work good so if you buy parts and build this along with me there's no guarantee that this is going to be a happy product at the end. So I would suggest you wait until I get finished with this thing and run it on the audio analyzer suite and give you all a thumbs up that this is a good project before you start building this. And for that reason, I'm not going to be publishing a bomb until I'm completely done with this. So please do not bug me in the comments and in my email box asking me for a bomb for this project because I'm not going to publish it until I'm completely finished with it and happy that it's a good product. So if you're enjoying this kind of content, please leave a comment or send me a message at my website contact page that how much you like this or keep going. I like enjoy this kind of content because that really inspires me to keep doing this kind of stuff. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't. The other thing you can do, make a donation at my website or join my Patreon. That helps me afford buying the parts and stuff to build these projects. And finally, like the video. That helps kind of get this thing propagated, gets me more views, and gets more people enjoying my content. So again, thanks for watching, and until the next segment, have a nice day.